I really, really appreciate and grateful for being here. So thank you a lot for uh, DEF CON, for DEF CON Reality Village, Sentinel One, and everyone that support me along the way. Uh, we'll speak about it also soon. Uh, let's start with uh, the title. So Akin Smart Devices for Fun and Profit. This is a true and genuine story about me uh, trying from exploiting my smart home into co gaining control over a thousand of smart devices in the entire world. So let's start. So first about me, um, my name is Barack Sternberg. I also live in Beef in Twitter, so make sure to follow. I'm a security researcher and also an author in Sentinel-1 Labs. Um, I have a master's on algo in computer science on algorithms. And one of the favorite things I love to mention is that I'm also a party lover and a DJ. So you can make sure you follow my Mixcloud on, uh, on, to see my set and stuff. But uh, besides throwing out party, which is not so relevant in the Corona period, um, I love to focus on vulnerability research. Um, I love computer security. I'm enthusiast about network security, IoT, embedded devices, uh, Linux, web apps, and more and more. And also to analyze in malwares in the wild. I'm a CTF player, and I love a good game of uh, hacking uh, any kind of devices. So with this in mind, uh, let's start. So starting uh, this project uh, goes quite well, well, way back. And when I say way back, I mean really back, 2010. Uh, what happened in 2010? So first, uh, we are renovating our family home. We are fixing all this home. The second most important thing was uh, the Walking Dead first season was just coming up. Uh, the first season, just to keep in mind, today it's the 10th season already, I think, of The Walking Dead, and it's keep counting. Amazing series, much watch, must watch one. And well, we installed smart home devices, which were the Philips Dynalite. And the Philips Dynalite have software and apps, but they were really, really expensive. Uh, back then it was really uh, high extras, and we didn't bought it. Just the technician came, installed these softwares, uh, and apps to itself uh, to configure all of our devices, all of our smart home systems. And from there on, uh, we didn't have anything to control it. So you can say it's a smart home device, but not quite really. And so we don't have any remote app control. And usually in these scenarios, we, we can think about ourselves as, uh, well, our own uh, technicians that can do it by ourselves, right? So why not do it ourselves? So this scary diagrams is not that scary. What you see here is actually um, the Philips Dynalite controllers that control my smart home devices in my, in my parents' home. The, this actually have been the controllers themselves. So as you can see here, this one is the full electricity diagram downloaded freely from the Philips uh, site. Uh, and the interesting thing you can observe here is that, well, each controller controls something, controls specific maybe lights, have specific capabilities and attributes. So this electricity diagram have on this side um, the channels, which are directly connected usually to the relays, to uh, to the dimmers, to the buttons, to uh, to anything. Uh, for example, they, this channel, channel one, have powered out electricity to your light, your light bulb, or maybe to a window, or maybe to a large light system or anything else. So this is on these sides, and this is our, the relays, the switch on and off stuff. And they, on the other side, they are connected, as you can see here, the microprocessor. This is the microprocessor. And this microprocessor is very cool because it's the, uh, the thing that connects between the, uh, the electricity circuits here and the serial, which is here. So on the, on its other end, there is a serial output, which you can obviously understand it might be the, the controlling area. So when I connect to these devices to configure them, I usually use this serial interface and this use something that's called Dynet protocol of the uh, Dynalite, Dynalite uh, Philips systems. And it's really cool. It's connected by RS485, uh, four, uh, four, uh, which is really, uh, it's not that unique in a sense that many industrial systems are actually using this kind of type of serials uh, compared to the usual serial RS2322. Uh, uh, um, and also what you can understand is that this serial is connected to this building block, which is, what is that? So this is a 
I bought actually an IP serial adapter. And this is a cool serial adapter that is used to uh, uh, connect all up between the serial and the IP. And I am sitting here gently and trying to, uh, to wait for something to happen, right? For, uh, sending commands, maybe seeing something, I don't know. So what happened next is that I tried to send calls to these controllers. I'm sending calls to these controllers and nothing happened, nothing. I use this wonderful GitHub repo, which is not complete. It has some several API documentations of Dynet No. 1, but it's not exactly the Dynet I needed. Mm, it's really weird. And also uh, the packets. So I, I could have observed the type of the packets the type of the packets uh, used to be sent to Dynet. The packets usually are in the structure of sync number, an area code, a command type, and some extra data to navigate and uh, to navigate between the different possibilities. For example, I want uh, the light to be in 100% or 50% uh, um, uh, percentage of, uh, of light. Uh, so I can put this stuff in the extra data uh, area which is right here. So this is a, a packet used to be sent over a serial connection as I seen before, as we have seen before. And this is really cool. So I start sending packets, nothing happens. And I remember me and my father are sitting in the saloon and like, mm, why not send in all the packets? And when I mean all the packets, let's just send, let's just fast the system, right? What could happen, right? Sending all opcodes to the controllers could be amazing thing to do, no? Uh, really all, like in 4 in X range uh, 256. And it wasn't a surprise that, um, um, yeah, uh, maybe you laugh right now, but it's actually a real thing. It's a house that people live in that went crazy. So we send all of these commands and all of a sudden, I remember myself sitting in the kitchen and all the lights are flipping crazy, windows turning on and off at the same time, and we don't know what is happening. And well, try to remember which command you send in this fuzzing loop that try to fuzz all these commands. So I did try to fix it uh, to my uh, re responsibility, of course, and I, I tried to fix it and I tried to reverse these commands and some of them have been fixed, but Remember this commands, not just for turning on and off the, the lights, it also controls the configuration, the main configuration of the lights and the buttons and, and everything you can think about. So this is insane. And well, I try to fix it. And um, yeah, and all of a sudden 6 a.m. I got this message from my mom um, sending me that, well, I hope you guys have fun the other day because I woke up 6 a.m. because all the lights were turning on at the same time. At this point, uh, we've come to a, um, a small conclusion that, well, the first one is that Barack is not touching again the smart home devices. We'll see about that later. But the second one is that, well, we need to install new smart home devices because until we do that, we don't actually have lights and powers and electricity for some things. So yeah. Okay, new smart home device. And I was excited because for me, it's another research to do. They didn't know that yet, but for me, it's a whole nother research. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so the new smart home devices is the HDL automation devices. And by HDL automation devices, I actually mean uh, a company which is called the H HDL automation. And this company is a big company, an amazing one actually. Uh, they, I must say to them, thank you because they helped me a lot through uh, uh, the disclosure and working with them, and they really consider the security uh, highly in this uh, in this uh, manners and respect. And also, they have more than ten thousand projects around the globe: museums, uh, buildings, hotels, uh, 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 headquarters of some high uh, priority companies and stuff like that, uh, using their systems. So even uh, airports, if I didn't say that. So it's really, really interesting to investigate these controllers, right? And they have smart controllers for lights, windows, cameras, a sensor, anything, anything you even didn't think about it. Uh, cool. So we learned about the HDL automation and we've, we've installed in our new family home, in our family home, the HDL smart home devices. Let's now see how the HDL smart home works. Sorry. So 
the HDL smart home system have three basic components. Uh, the first component is the HDL demo relay modules. This is the uh, modules which you can observe just right here. These modules have on the one uh, direction outside this serial, exactly kind of the same serial you've seen in the Philips Dynalite systems uh, with uh, RS-485 uh, connections, uh, which they call bus pro, of course, because for example, this bus pro is the complete analogy of the Dynet. So this is like the protocols upside on the up of the on the upper side of the uh, uh, of the serial connection. Cool. And this is connected to the IP gateway. This IP gateway uh, is actually kind of the same as I built an IP gateway to adapt between uh, the serial and the IP connection from the serial to the internet to the entire world. So this is they have their own smart devices. They have their own unique. A IP adapter as well. Also, Philips have it, but it's it was really really expensive. This is why I didn't bought it. Uh, also, in the second time, but in our scenario, uh, my parents thought, okay, it's a good idea. Let's buy all the things. So, uh, Barack doesn't even have an idea to start and and jiggling with this with these kind of things. Oh boy, they were wrong. And this IP gateway is serial to IP. And the third, the third bullet was the HDL cloud servers. The HDL cloud servers are actually uh, used mainly for remote connections, but not just remote connections. They used to store the configuration for the smart home devices. They used to connect remotely to things because you have routers, you have firewall. So these IP gateways is connected to this HDL core server, cloud servers. And then when you are online on the internet, you can connect to their HDL cloud servers with public uh, IP. A public IP interface, so you can reach your devices as well. And now a little bit uh, uh, deeper about how they install it. So first time installation is quite easy and it works like this. You install the HDL Basketball software as a technician. So for example, I'm a technician, I'm coming to your home, I'm installing the HDL Basketball software on my desktop machine and I connect directly with my PC, my technician PC, to this IP gateway. It's very cool. And when I'm connected to this IP gateway with my HDL bus port, I starting to configure all these devices. Because remember, these devices are connected serially to this IP gateway. So I connect to this IP gateway and configure all these ones. And I that's what I say, I line configure the bus port adapter and I have a configuration. Now that I have a configuration, I can use this data, this configuration data, to uh, upload it, for example, to the cloud uh, and save it also on my Android app in other apps as well. So what I do next is register a new account in the HDL own application. This is an Android application of HDL automation, and it's used to control remotely and also locally within the Wi-Fi, uh, these smart home devices. And when, as a technician, I register this new account, I also upload the local configuration to the app itself. So now remember, I have a phone in my hand. I register the new account in this application and I upload the configuration from this IP gateway or from my laptop, uh, from the Bus Pro uh, desktop software to this phone. I upload the configuration to my phone. And now the configuration to control everything in my smart home devices is inside my phone. So for my phone, I can also connect to the internet. And this is exactly how I back up my configuration in the cloud. So after I have the configuration in my phone, I upload it also to the cloud. And now it's also kept here. Cool. So what happens when a new user comes in and joins to our, to our game and wants to also to enter uh, these uh, devices and control them? So what happens next is that uh, he first time he downloads the HDL own app. Why does that? Because he needs to log in to the HDL account that has been opened to him directly in order to control all these uh, dimmers and other devices. So he download this HDL on app and he log into the HDL account that has been opened by the technician. And what he does next, you can actually bet on that, that, well, yes, he download the configuration from the cloud. And when he download the configuration from the cloud, he have all the configuration to fully control these devices over here within the Wi-Fi or from remote. So I'm a bit cheating here because there are two possibilities to operate these devices. And we'll talk about it in the next slide, which is the um, remote and the local mode. So we can 
operate this HDL system in a remote and local connection. And the difference between them is that the local connection is accessible from Wi-Fi, uh, usually only from Wi-Fi and local networks. And the remote is uh, accessible from the wide internet and from anywhere inside the world. And usually it makes a real sense that we want to make a remote control connection about it because, well, we want to be able to, uh, for example, I have an air conditioner and I want to control this, uh, this air conditioner before I get on because it's really, really hot today and it's a summer. So I would love it to be operated before I get back home, right? Uh, and this is really a cool thing. And at first time installation, the technician actually uh, uh, choose whether to, uh, to enable allow, and allow remote connections or not. And usually many times because of the reasons I mentioned, the remote connection is enabled. And this is really interesting. Remember that in any scenario, remember that in any scenario, um, we are using the HDL cloud service because in the first scenario of the Wi-Fi local connection, we still back up our configuration for new users to come. And on the remote connection mode, of course, we use these cloud servers to connect back to us. So the third point, the third bullet is always used. The HDL cloud servers are amazing, super interesting. Um, yeah, Internet of Things. Uh, now let's add Wi-Fi to uh, all the things and let's see what happens. Um, cool. So the focus of my research. Yes, we can research one and two, uh, but first my family will kill me again if I will destroy all their smart home devices uh, using the connection to the one and two bullets. And the second reason and the most relevant one, because I love your family, but it's not that, uh, that uh, uh, exciting and relevant. The, the, re the most relevancy is the hardware. The hardware and the software can be really device dependent. And it will take a lot of time to investigate and research any specific device because each device is, has its own capabilities, own serial connection, own things. And to, to reach to the point you can really research and find vulnerabilities takes much more time and much more time from other things which are publicly known as cloud servers or websites. So of course, uh, I thought that the HDL cloud server, which are a critical bottleneck in these connections, um, are really, really an interesting and a great idea to investigate. And also when you think about a CISO, a CISO view or, or a view of, uh, of some people that works for the, uh, to, of the network uh, security and the integrity of the network, uh, you might think that what you need to defend uh, might be, might be not always, is from the outside, from arbitrary outside and from the inside, from specific devices. But in this scenario, this cloud server might be okay, might be whitelisted, fully whitelisted, because this cloud server is just connecting to these devices, just connected to your devices, to your certified devices you put in your systems. But you need to understand, even as someone that works for security, that the bottleneck is can be also outside your organization. And also in the third bullet, in servers that you don't even have the code for them and you don't even know what they're actually kind of doing. So this is really interesting in the point of focus as well. But we speak about focus a lot. Let's now speak about the cloud server. So a starting point for this is the AGL on app, how it works the AGL on app. So first is the login screen. Yeah, nice login screen. You can see a simple login here and a sign up button also. And the forgot password mechanism, which is really cool. And also interesting, forgot password actually is working the same as you think. It, it sends you a, a, a reset a, a link to your email and you can click on this, uh, on this link and immediately go to this uh, link. But, uh, but the URL, the URL in the forgot password was really, really interesting. And we'll speak about it later. Uh, sign up, sign up include, you can enter either phone or an email. And you can also add the password. Uh, well, you should add the password. Um, and uh, then you have your Leofin enabled. And after that, you can upload from the app the configuration you have. You remember this IP gateway where I configure all this stuff. So I can upload the configuration from this IP adapter to my phone. And from there on, I can upload this to the cloud. And I can also download. Uh, cloud configurations using this app to configure 
my system, my, my application to control these devices in my Wi-Fi network and stuff. Uh, so this is the sign up. Well, enough chit chat. Uh, let's talk about vulnerabilities. So the first vulnerability, really cool, account takeover number one, or let's forget our password together. So let's forget our password. I click on the forgot password and I got this following link. Well, this seemed like an, a nice, naive link that doesn't gonna affect anyone, right? Uh, well, the main thing you can see here and observe, I, I will make sure you understand that. Uh, well, there are a couple of parameters, really, really interesting. The first one is the time. Time seems like just the time in, in some format. An email, which is actually my email, the email that I want to reset the password now for. And par this parameter and these kind of parameters as well. And this is really, really interesting because um, you can think that uh, uh, maybe something random should be placed there, right? Something random that I couldn't fake this kind of link. Um, you could also think that if I change this email to any arbitrary email, I it won't work, right? It, it will be verified in some manner and they won't let me change the password for any arbitrary user. Come on. Well, they did. They actually did let me change any user um, a password a, by its email to any user. And the way to exploit it, for example, if I'm thinking otherwise, is to do forget password to my email account, get this link, okay? And change only the email, the email area to the victim emails. And from there on, I get fully uh, authorization to change its password. This link needs to change the password of this user. I can fully change its password, really cool. And it works, perfect. So uh, let's do it again. So account takeover number two, or maybe let's forget our password. I, again, and how can we do? Uh, how can we do it? So let's forget now about the users. I already show you uh, about the users and the the forgetting the passwords again. And and now let's focus about other thing that called the technician user. Uh, the technician user is the user that is automatically generated when the user register with its email. So when the user first time register with, with an email, for example, a technician install the system and register your HDL account, what he's, what he's doing is actually also opens up automatically a technician user with the same password as the username, as the original user. For example, I open and register with this email at mymail.com. It is automatically also open a technician user at email-debug at mymail.com. And this is really interesting now because the technician user is able to change settings and control all system configuration of the smart home devices as well. And this can be really bad, right? If we can hack this technician user, we can also change the cloud configuration. We can also do many, many more things. Um, in these times, I usually uh, ask the, the, the crowd if they know how to hack this system. I, I guess some of you actually understand why, where I'm going to, and it's actually really working. So the exploit and to take over any technician user, what we need to do is to find the victim email, let's say victim at mymail.com and open a new email at this mymail.com service at victim-debug at mymail.com. So I open this new email account and I have it. And yes, what I will do next is just forget my password. I click on forgot password for this victim-debug at mymail.com. And when I do reset password to this account, I will be sending, they will send to me um, their email of link reset, the reset of the password. So I actually can change the victim-debug uh, at mymail.com password. So I actually can get access to all the technician features. I can access the technician user. Um, just to conclude and to make sure everyone is with me, what I'm doing is I'm opening another uh, account for the technician email at victim-debug at mymail.com. And I call the reset password for this uh, email. And, and this is really cool and it's working. And the reason it's working is because they don't verify this email is, not, is they, they don't verify this email is not a, uh, is not a valid uh, 
email and they shouldn't send a forget password to this uh, email to these technician users as, at all or even find another another way to put uh, users for the technician which is not relevant with this dash debug um yes it really worked and it made me to take over any any account of well technician accounts um very cool it's working for some providers not all of them i I feel in the sense that some of them replacing Dash with, with another. So it can probably be bypassed even in mails that doesn't allow Dash in their username, but I need to think about it even more. Cool. So now we spoke about the pre-authentication vulnerabilities. Let's see what is happening post-authentication. So let's get our devices um, and start investigating some several API endpoints. And I actually encountered many API endpoints which are open and some of them were uh, the device by region list. And the device by region list is a very interesting API endpoint. Uh, it comes right after the login, you log in and you have a device list and you can actually search uh, this device list by, um, by the region name, by the region ID, by device ID, by anything you want. So it's really cool. And how you do it, you go to the device section and the parameters to control is the region ID, uh, device ID, device name, so all of these guys are fully controllable and very, very interesting. Um, so the first try I did was sending this. This was in the post data uh, body of the message I've been sending. And this data was uh, uh, containing the parameters need to be searched for. And as you can observe quite well, there is like the SQL injection I try to put. And well, yes, it did return to me all the devices in the system. But remember to, uh, to find out if there is an SQL injection in the site or not, it's not enough just to test for this kind of screen and to see that I get all the data. I need to do a little bit more than that and to see that it actually does an SQL statement I fully control of black book, black book wise. Cool. And so the second try was something like this. And it actually worked again and I got all the devices. So it's not, and also I, I try to, to make an invalid SQL statement. And what I got is that I get a response, an error response specifically on invalid SQL statements. So yes, I have an SQL injection. Very, very cool. I get in all the data, all the data, uh, not in the DB, all the data I have on my devices. So there is some way to gain control and to get all the data. Of the, HD, of the HDL database. So why not extracting more data, right? Um, well, problems. Some of the problems is that uh, the returned columns and specifically the ASP parser. So the server, uh, as far as I tell you, it's the HDL cloud servers, uh, they have ASP server inside of them, Windows server. And this ASP parser checks the validity of the return columns. So for example, if I do a union SQL injection, I need to verify and validate that all my data return is correctly to the manner of the ASP parser. And if it's not, I wouldn't be able to pass and get my data. I just get in an error, error response, nothing happens. And well, yes, you might think to yourself, well, just do blind SQL injection, right? That's do like SQL uh, time SQL injection, something like that. But it's not that, that easy because I, I am bounded in this scenario by not sending so much data. Well, uh, first thing is that I didn't want to alert the system. I didn't want to bomb the system. I didn't want to stress the, the system or to do anything like that in a sense. And well, and the second thing is that uh, um, even if I do, uh, I will do it. It can take a lot of time because uh, I have more than 11 columns returning from the SQL injection from the from this, uh, from this SQL query, not injecting, from the SQL query, more than 11 columns, which means almost 4 million queries will be required to inspect all the relevant types and values. Because remember, the ASP parser also checks for the validity, even of the ranges of some of the, of the values returned. Uh, yes. And also, if it's worth mentioning that, uh, well, I didn't use VPN and it's a really good reason not to like jiggle with the site and try to brute force like arbitrary sites. So yeah, um, not a good idea. Don't try it at all. 
And so this is the blind SQL injection idea. As I told you, even time though pass the error, yes or no, would take a lot of time. Cool. But let's forget about this SQL injection. Let's think about another way to bypass the ASP parser. You all must agree with me that if um, I find another SQL injection that returned must, much, much less columns, I could go over all their possibilities with this union SQL injection or something like that and finding out the relevant order to make it work and to return all the data and bypass the ASP parser. So this is exactly what I was going for. So to bypass the ASP parser, I was going to the, the you remember the device name, this is the original parameter for the SQL injection. I try to find this device name, the exact name, the exact argument in another APIs, another API endpoint. And I actually did find it. I find it in the get room binding device. There is the device name parameter. There is an SQL injection there. Uh, you go to the room section, you search by the device binding name and voila, you have an SQL injection. Very cool, SQL injection in the same argument. And the most amazing thing here is that only four columns are being returned. Only four columns, that's all. And it's really amazing. So we can do the permutation over all these options uh, with the possibility to do all of it uh, really, really uh, in short amount of queries. So uh, permutating over columns order and trying the correct try to make it was doing like this. So here you can see the union SQL injection and here you can see and observe the uh, the parameters I, I've been put and I just crumbled and primitive this one anytime and try to see if it works. And I also increased the number of columns because I didn't really know the number of columns, uh, but I knew it was around four. Uh, I, I say only four, I'm sorry. It's like, it was really around four because I seen that the number of columns was uh, four in the data, but it could be maybe one more for the ID or the key saved in the SQL. But it was eventually four, so it doesn't really interesting. And I found that this is working. And to conclude all of this, it was quite amazing to see that I'm getting all the database with one single query, one single SQL injection to rule them all, bypassing the ASP parser, um, and getting all the database, uh, all the things as well. Cool. So at this point, of course, I, I reached the HGL automation company. Uh, I did fully coordinated disclosure with them, worked, worked with them uh, silently and helped them a lot. And they also helped me. Um, they were really enthusiastic about helping and, and securing the system. So it was great for them. And But let's now speak about how we can hack into any arbitrary HDL user. For example, you have your own, I don't know, HDL account in your smart home in Dubai, or you have your own smart home in some airport because there are airports and museum in HGL. So you can actually find a scenario of how you can uh, fully control any, any HGL account. Uh, what we found that the vulnerabilities we have is two SQL injection and two account takeovers. And there are two scenarios to gain full takeover over any user. The first scenario, you know the attackers, uh, they, you know the victim's user uh, email. You know the victim's email and you just uh, get from the database uh, the hashed salted password and you now brute force this password. And when you brute force the, this password, you can get after sometimes the password, of course. And the second option is to do one of the takeovers I've mentioned. Actually, the second one, the technician one, is much more silently because when you do account takeover of the, or account takeover over the technician account, usually the normal accounts use the normal people, the, the older people that use uh, normal people in the in the sense of using the system, they use the uh, normal accounts. And they don't use the technician account only for configuration and when something gets wrong. So you can connect and take over only the, the technician account and it will work silently and no one will know. The second scenario is where you can control any arbitrary HDL user uh, without, uh, without an email. And now we can do it. Uh, for example, you know the company name, you know the phone name of the victim, you know 
its its full name in a sense or something like that. So you can scrape through the HDL database and find its account, find its email, and then go back to the first scenario and act this its uh, its user by any of these uh, possibilities. Um, okay, really, really cool. So we can act any AGL user in the entire world. Let's now go through the security implications to conclude what I've been talking about. So let's start with the easy going security implications, not to frighten uh, uh, all the people so much. So the first security implications are the private data leaks, of course, hash passwords, um, emails, phone numbers, company names, names in general, tremendous uh, amount of uh, of, uh, of uh, data. And also the HDL Cloud backup configuration is there, which gives us the following, the full smart devices info. And the full smart devices info is amazing. What you see here, what you can observe here is exactly from the app. And you can see that this app can control cameras, TVs, security sensors in other manners, and air conditioners also in the server rooms as well. Um, internal network IPs can be exposed using the systems as well, firmware versions. Internal network IPs are because they are written inside of the configuration, some of them. And you can actually use some of them to observe and, and see where are the HDL devices, the IPs, and uh, some of them kind of in the sense. And very cool. And also the remote control. So can, you can actually, uh, gain, of course, remote control over these things and you can adjust well, as I said before, the air conditioner in the server room, you can make it up to 50 Celsius. Uh, I don't think they actually support it, but 35, something like that for a week would probably destroy the server room, I guess. And also to watch their uh, IP cameras. And uh, so it can be really, really bad. Disable some sensors. Now, uh, I'm sorry for that in advance. This kind of a pure evil, uh, a pure evil ideas, uh, but we need to discuss them because we need to, to understand and realize that the security implications, even if I don't have a full RC over any kind of device, that, that there are tremendous uh, and high impact and costly impacts over the organizations as well that can be done. And the first one is, well, you can add internal non-exposed IPHD gateways. Sometimes they are hiding the gateways that controls other system. For example, hidden security areas, hidden secure rooms and stuff like that. You can actually expose them because there is an auto search functionality in the app. Another thing you can do is you can do, uh, you can encrypt all the configurations, remove all the configuration from the, from the HDL app. And some people can do kind of a ransomware and blackmail the companies. And until they won't do it, you won't give them back their possibility to control their system, to control their lights, to control their, their powers, their ACs. This can really shut down a company in the, in the logistics, in the industri industry manner, uh, log logistics manner a lot. Another thing is to use a conditioner to affect critical locations. Um, and also uh, something I really love, uh, which is called an hidden trigger attack. What is an hidden trigger attack? So let's, for example, say that we are not in the Wi-Fi. We are not in a local connection, okay? You are a smart guy. You block all the remote connections. You keep only the local connections. But remember, the configuration is still on on the HDL cloud servers. So when the user will update, and it will update its configuration sometimes, you can actually connect the button, this, for example, switch on the lights, to the button that's also uh, switch uh, and adjust the air conditioner to 35 degrees, 35 Celsius degrees. So you can connect two buttons, for example, to the same button. So the user thinks he just open up the light, but he actually did a lot of other stuff as well. Disabled sensors and did a lot of other things. And for this attack, you don't even need the remote mode connection. Even in the local mode, it can be really affect the users in the organization because the configuration is still on the HDL cloud backup uh, database. The HDL cloud servers are really affecting the organization as a bottleneck. Also, another thing you can do, you can disable and control other critical sensors, of course. You can disable security cameras. You can disable sensor for overeating, security alerts, security alerts, sorry, um, and also you name it. Um, well, this is another idea. This is not a direct security uh, issue, but this is another idea I, I had in mind, which is exploiting the internal network, 
for example, I can change a cloud configuration file to a malicious one, maybe something that does something on the device. Maybe I can exploit the device when they update the configuration file on the device. It can be really interesting. It can be ideas for further research and stuff like that. So this is really cool. And it increases the attack surface to the internal network and to the organization as well. Uh, cool. So we are coming to conclusion. And some of the ideas to continue is, of course, to find a way from the account takeover uh, to get in, uh, into the internal network of the organization. Can it be done? How it can be done? Uh, taking over the device, taking over something like something else, maybe taking advantage of the way they control the smart home devices in the network. I don't know, you name it. And another thing is um, to access from the LAN and the Wi-Fi access. For example, I have already Wi-Fi and LAN access. How to, do, to find an RC over one of the uh, smart devices platform, specifically, of course, the IP uh, adapter, the IP serial adapter of the HDL uh, gateway devices, which is really cool also. And yes, so many amazing ideas can be done. Um, it can be amazing, amazing. I had so much fun uh, working for this project. And I come really to conclusion. I want to thank uh, anyone, uh, starting from the AGL automation company, uh, for fast fix and coordinated disclosure of all the vulnerabilities. AG Automation, you are really great, and I love working with you guys. Um, the second thing is that I wanted to uh, really uh, thank uh, Offer Peleg, uh, which is the HDL Israel representative, for supporting me along the way and helping me fix the issues also. Uh, amazing guy. And, uh, well, of course, uh, thank you to my family for letting me break in their house. Uh, but only one time, only one time, hopefully not on the second time, but we will see about that. And of course, and of course, I'm really thankful for uh, Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1, thank you for sponsoring and supporting my research. Uh, thank you so much. And well, I think that is it. We are coming to reach to a live questions and answers. So if you want to, uh, if you have any questions uh, to my, uh, about my lecture, or if you want to read my full blog. So first, uh, I wanted to know that my full blog and my full research will be published right now as we speak in the Sentinel Labs blog. So make sure you follow uh, Sentinel Labs and go to the Sentinel Labs site in Sentinel One. And there is my full research with a lot of other uh, code sections and stuff like this. And for now on, I will go to the question and answers uh, in the Discord channel in DEFCON for more questions and answer. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have in mind. And thank you all for listening. Thank you all uh, for coming here. And I hope to see you soon in DEFCON in another uh, even non-corona events we can see face-to-face -face also. So thank you very much.